There are two characteristics common to all photographs, light and time. Several advancements between the mid-1870s and 1900 altered photographic history and enlarged the scope of the medium. During that time, new films were made, new photo papers were created, new cameras, which included cameras that could easily be handheld and were portable. This is also the period with the advent of the motion picture. New lighting techniques were developed, including both flash and flares. New methods for photomechanical reproduction methods were developed during this time, meaning photographs could now be reproduced in newspapers, magazines, and books. Previously, photographs to be reproduced in these publications needed to be transcribed by an artist who etched drawings made directly from the photographs. The comparative ease of the dry plate process helped foster many of these changes. Dry plates were first marketed in 1867, but these were too slow, often with exposures as much as 30 seconds. But the process was refined and perfected by 1878. Dry plates allowed pre-coated light-sensitive glass plates to be made. They were commercially available. Dry plates need not be developed immediately, unlike the wet plate process. From start to finish, from coating to development, you had about a half hour. Dry plates, you could photograph and then process them days, months later. The sensitivity to light with dry plates was increased. This created the opportunity for fast exposures down to a fraction of a second. George Eastman began to market dry plates in 1879, one of the first Americans to do so. There were several British firms also that sold dry plates, and in that year, 1879, there were 14 firms worldwide selling dry plates. Photographers no longer had to make their own emulsions on the spot. Because of the sensitivity of dry plates, cameras were soon redesigned to contain shutters. Hi, I have a typical 35mm single lens reflex camera here, Pentex K1000. Uh, how the camera works is light goes through the lens and will strike the film in the back of the camera. The film goes across here. Uh, what you see here, and it's going to be a little hard to see because it's uh, flat black, um, so it doesn't reflect light inside the camera, uh, but this is a curtain. It's a cloth curtain that when I depress the shutter will move across the frame and expose the film through, uh, through the lens, light coming through the lens, and expose the film uh, for a specific instant of time. In this case, I have it set at a half second, so I'm going to cock the shutter. It's going to be a little hard to see but I'm going to depress that and you can kind of hear um, the uh, shutter and the mirror system here. The mirror flips up and down to allow the uh, light to uh, strike the film. But I'm going to show you this a, a slightly different way from the back of the camera, which will probably be easier for you to see. I'm going to point the lens more or less towards my uh, red shirt here and depress for a half second. Let me do that one more time. And hopefully you could see the light coming through the lens. If I had film back here and had the, the uh, cover closed, uh, that uh, light would be striking and exposing the film. Photographers, since the medium's inception, look for ways to stop motion. With dry plates, this was now possible. The ability of photography to stop or suspend motion proved the unreliability of the human eye for studying motion. Also, Dyes were added to dry plate gelatins to make the emulsion equally sensitive to all the visible colors. In the era of wet plate and previous photographic processes, they were overly sensitive to blue and undersensitive to red. With dry plates, that was no longer the case. Dry plates led to other photographic developments. In 1888, George Eastman produced his first Kodak camera, it was a point-and-shoot box camera. You press the button, we do the rest, was the advertising campaign. They used roll film. Here you can see 
After taking a picture, you would simply advance the film to the next frame. The early Kodak cameras would hold up to 100 exposures. Kodak would send you a box loaded with film. You would take the pictures, point in the direction that you wanted the picture made. The earliest ones had no viewfinder, so it was a bit of guesswork as what you got with your final image. Once you were done with that roll of film, you simply sent the whole box back to Kodak, who processed the film, made prints, sent the prints and negatives back to you, as well as a camera loaded with a new roll of film. In 1891, Kodak introduced a plastic emulsion base for film. The size, ease, cost, and availability led to the casual use of photography. The era of snapshots were born, which influenced later generations of photographers. Also during this period, printing out papers replaced albumin. Largely this happened by the turn of the century. Albumin prints pretty much became obsolete by 1920, as the printing out papers were quicker and easier to process. They too were commercially available. By 1894, 35mm roll film was available. Cameras were designed smaller and lighter and could be held by the hand. A couple examples of early 20th century cameras. These could fit in the palm of the hand. And they were outfitted with shutters, as you see here. Each one of these should be seen as a fraction, with a one over it, so... That would be a half second, a quarter second, a sixtieth of a second, up to one one thousandth of a second on, on that camera. Flash photography, first using a magnesium flare and then a magnesium flash was developed. You may have seen this in pictures or, uh, or movies of turn of the century times. The magnesium flash, you would put a bit of powdered magnesium on a plate set that off with a match and you would have an explosion with a fair amount of light and the aftermath was also as you see in this picture a lot of smoke as well. Etienne Jules Marais was a French physiologist. Physiology was a relatively new science of the movement of the human body and allowed Marais to indulge his love for physics and engineering. Marais considered the body an animate machine subject to the same laws as inanimate machines, and he dedicated his life to analyzing the laws that governed its movements. He made motion studies, published in the book that you just saw, The Animal Machine, in 1873, that aroused the interest of California Governor Leland Stanford. Stanford, in turn, commissioned Edward Mybridge, to make a series of photographs to help him prove a bet. Mybridge was a British-born active in America. We looked at some of Mybridge's landscape photographs in one of our last lectures. His landscape works were mostly of Yosemite. They were done in direct competition with another San Franciscan photographer, Carlton Watkins. Mybridge's views are dramatic and show the sublime, magnificent landscape, as you see in these examples. In 1873, Mybridge was commissioned by Leland Stanford to prove a bet. Stanford owned racehorses. In depictions prior to the invention of photography, the racehorse was always shown in what was been called the flying gallop. Its front legs straight out, its back legs straight back. Stanford did not think this is how horses actually ran, and he had a bet with a friend of his that that was the case, that indeed that flying gallop, as it's called, was not the way that horses ran. But without the aid of shutters or cameras, it was impossible to prove. So Mybridge set out to prove that. I wanted to show you a couple of covers of recent books. This is The River of Shadows, Edward Mybridge and the Technological Wild West by Rebecca Solnit, one of contemporary America's absolutely greatest writers. It's one of the most interesting photo books I've ever read. 
It's an account of Mybridge's life and his impact, as well as the impact of photography on the lives of people in the world. To say the least, Mybridge was a colorful character. In 1874, he was tried for murdering his wife's lover. He had been married to a younger woman, by all accounts a very beautiful woman. When Mybridge was away making photographs, when he returned, he came back and heard rumors that his wife had taken up with a famous San Francisco actor, himself quite handsome. Mybridge investigated this a bit, found out that it was probably true, Hearing that Mybridge had learned of their affair, the actor left San Francisco to hide away at a friend's house. Mybridge found out about this, went to the house, knocked on the door. The actor answered, Mybridge shot him dead. He was tried for murder and acquitted because of justifiable homicide. Certainly things have changed since, for the good. He was advised after this that he should probably leave the country for a while until things cooled off. He thought that reasonable, and he left, came back in 1877, and resumed his work for Stanford. I should tell you, too, that earlier, Mybridge had been involved in a stagecoach crash where he fell and hit his head on a rock. His personality changed after that, and he became quite erratic at times. Another great book, and a recent book, by Byron Wolf and Scott Brady. Byron is a former colleague, used to teach here at California State University, Chico. He's now the head of the photo program at Tyler School of Art, Temple University's art program. Stanford, you may know from Stanford University, but again, he was governor of California, quite rich, one of the wealthy railroad barons. You can see examples of his house here in San Francisco. He had the means to hire a photographer to prove a bet. This is an example, prior to Mybridge's photographs, of how horses were generally depicted in art. You can see, and again, this is called the flying gallop, but you can see they're shown with the front hooves, straight forward, the back hooves back. Because of our persistence of vision, we can't stop motion as we're looking at things. So artists were trying to depict these animals in the most accurate means possible, but there was no way to determine that exactly. So what Mybridge did, he set up a track at Stanford's Palo Alto Estate, it's now part of Stanford University, along that horse track, they built a wall here that contained a grid, you'll see that in some of the photographs. They built this building that included an area to place cameras. He made a succession of 12 cameras set up along this route would have strings or wires across the track. As the horse ran down the track, it would break the string, which would trip the shutter, and created, in a succession of 12 photographs, views of a horse in full gallop. He succeeded in 1878 to prove Stanford's allegation. He used shutter speeds around 1 1,000th of a second. This image, which you can see in the second frame, showed Stanford to be correct that instead of that flying gallop, when a horse was in full gallop, his hooves were tucked close to the body, not straight out and straight back. This was the photographic proof. This sequence of images was groundbreaking. It became seen worldwide. People were thrilled at this. Finally, photography had the ability to stop motion, and you could study the locomotion of animals and other kinds of things. Some other examples. And again, if I can go back for a second, you can see the grid in the back of the the image there. 
along the track, hear a pony trotting with a man trailing, another view. Made all sorts of photographs, not only of horses, but human locomotion and other animals as well. Again, the reminder, the flying gallop. So until Mybridge's photographs, this was almost always how horses were depicted galloping. Another view. Mybridge's discovery was groundbreaking. Here you can see it illustrated on the cover of Scientific America. The image was published in multiple ways. Here you can see lithographic drawings based on Mybridge's photographs. You can see various kinds of horses in these sequences. Notice it's in German. These were seen worldwide. It was groundbreaking. It shattered our views previous to this. Another sequence. And you can kind of imagine these animated. Artists were influenced by these, and you can see in these sculptures by the famous French artist Edgar Degas, the horse galloping, which you can see are done more true to form than how horses had been thought to have run prior to this. And you can see these were done just a couple years after Mybridge's discoveries. Indeed, these have been animated digitally. So let me show you a sequence of these still photographs in quick succession. You can see these photographs led to the start of the motion picture industry. That was quick. Let me just do that one more time. I have a few videos in this lecture. Let's go ahead and play this one. It's kind of silly, but it's fun. So as you can see, my bridge photographed all sorts of things. He ended up photographing not just horses, but all sorts of animals, and you're going to see that in a variety of sequences here. He eventually published these in a series called Animal Locomotion that included 781 separate plates of animals and humans moving. And this is a case of someone just walking, spinning around, and walking back. You see it done in a variety of ways. And that, too, someone has animated online. In 1880 through 1882, Mybridge traveled and entertained people with illustrated lectures using his Zoopraxiscope, a series of projected images in quick succession which gave the illusion of movement. Moving pictures were born. The example that you see here, this housing would include a lamp. You had a round plate here, which you would put in the machine here. You would use that crank to move the glass plate. And in between, there's a black slide, and so you would get a flickering image, each one in a series or a sequence, a succession, to create this sense of movement. And so the light would be coming through here, through that image, the lens would be closer. This is just broken away so you can see how it would work, but the lens would be closer to the image. The light would go through the, the disc onto the lens. The lens would project that out to a screen. People were thrilled with these. Again, this is long before we had 
movie theaters or TV or anything like that. So this was such a groundbreaking approach, adapting photography to the motion picture. So here's an example of one of those discs. And you can kind of imagine it spinning around with a light flickering behind it to give you the sense of a moving image. And again, this has been animated. So you can see what that would have looked like if you saw this projected in a dark room for the first time. It would almost look like magic. This is actually a cartoon, but it's a great little uh, piece by Ben Harmer here. I love that short little film. Mybridge pictures were also adapted to the zoetrope. The zoetrope had been invented in 1834, was another early precursor to motion pictures. The zoetrope is essentially a child's toy. You take the sequence of images inside essentially a box with little slits, and you see it here. You spin the, the, the box and look through the slits here, and it gave you a sense of, again, one picture after the next. It gave you the sense of a moving picture. Again, I have a short little video to show you to illustrate the zoetrope. Another precursor to actual motion pictures was the kinetoscope. An employee of Thomas Edison developed this between 1889 and 1892. You can see the kinetoscope here used 35 millimeter film with sprocket holes so that gears could advance the film up and down and the viewer would look into a little viewing piece here and again through the sequence of these would see what appeared to be moving pictures. Popular form of entertainment. These were called peep shows and I also have a video to show you of that.
There's where you would view. So you put your eyes in there. And it's going to kind of break open the kinetoscope and show you the inner workings of this machine. A series of gears turn and lead the film across. Light inside the machine to project the image through the film. I'm going to give you the side view. There's still a few of these around here and there. It's also another device made to use to create moving pictures, the Praxinoscope, which was developed in 1877. It's sort of like Zoetrope. I'll show you an example of that. In this case, like the Zoetrope, but instead in the middle is a series of mirrors. So you look at the mirror. In 1884 and 1885, Mybridge was hired by Thomas Aikens at the University of Pennsylvania to produce the view's animal locomotion. Again, this included 781 plates. It included both humans and animals in various types of motion. Mybridge promoted these for the use of artists so that they could paint or draw or illustrate in more accurate human anatomy or animal anatomy. They go from the serious to the absurd. The idea that they are naked in these pictures, you could see the muscles as they're being used. Did a lot of pictures of nude women in motion. Again, they range from the serious to the absurd. I don't have a slide of it, but I have seen one of these where it's two women, one seated, one standing. The standing one walks over, picks up a, a bucket, walks over to the seated woman, and pours a bucket of water on her head. My guess is not too many artists were dying to illustrate that in the late 19th century. But I wanted to show you that Mybridge's influence is long-lasting. Well into the 20th century, you continued to see the influence of his work here in an advertisement for Haynes pantyhose. English painter Francis Bacon had a number of Mybridge reproductions in his studio. You can see his painting on the left and how that was pulled largely from Mybridge photographs. A couple of really fun recent projects influenced by Mybridge's work. It's a short piece here. In this piece, the artist printed Mybridge-like photographs, put them along the centerpiece in a highway, and the video you see is someone driving along in the car, seeing one image after the other after the other to, to create the illusion of movement. This is another really great piece.
So the artist would have somebody ride a bike, which would crank the movement of a disc, showing the horse running. Light the rider, and so the shadow of the rider looks like it's running the horse. Projected on the outside of the building. What I like about these pieces is it shows that history is alive, that we're always looking back and seeing new ways to learn about and understand not only the past, but the present. So we return to Etienne Jules Marais, the French physiologist. His graphs influenced and inspired Stanford to hire Mybridge to do his locomotion studies. Those studies in turn influenced Etienne Jules Marais to relook at using photography in his pursuit of his study of motion. He wrote, Movement is the most important action in that all bodily functions lend their aid to accomplish it. While Marais very much admired the results of Mybridge, he was dissatisfied with the lack of precision in the images of birds. In 1882, he perfected the photographic gun, as he called it, capable of taking 12 exposures in one second. Maré quickly abandoned his gun and later that year, 1882, invented a chronophotographic fixed plate camera equipped with a time shutter. Here you can see an example of the gun here that would have film inside and you'd fire off your exposures Again, in a quick succession, one after the other, in his case, in attempt to photograph birds in flight and to stop them in motion. Another illustration of that, similar in a way to Mybridge's zoopraxiscope, but applied to film in a camera. Printed example of a bird in flight the sequence of images. Marais also on one plate made multiple exposures, and again, in a quick succession. In this case, he had a man run across this, the frame. What these dots and lines are, it's the head with a piece of reflective material, shoulder, the arm, and the legs and the feet. So as the, they reflected light as the man moved across the frame in this sequence or series of pictures, again, we get the illusion of movement in a kind of abstract but studyable kind of way. A man moving across the frame with reflective material on his clothes in a sequence of quick exposures one right after the other all on the same photographic plate to create these really beautiful abstractions. Here you can see the example a man dressed in black and you can see the point on his head, his arms, his hip, his knee, on down the leg, etc. Here you can kind of see the body making these movements measurable. Well, those illustrations influenced one of 20th century's most interesting artists, Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp was one of the very first abstract artists, and he started doing illustrations and paintings based off of Marais' photographs. So in the early days where painting influenced photography, or to the point now where photography influences painting. Here you can see one of Duchamp's most famous pieces, also one of his most controversial pieces, Nude Descending a Staircase. It's one of the classics of modern art. 
and you can see completely influenced by the Etienne Jules Moray photographs. In those chrono photographic plate, again, you can see somebody taking a long cane and moving it. And as he moves it, as it bends, that sequence of photographs on that one plate of very quick exposures, one after another, records that movement in a way that the human eye is unable to see. We would just see these moving things as blurs, but the camera stops that motion. And for someone who's studying human movement, this tool was indispensable. But it's the visual aspects of these pictures that continue to influence. Again, you can see he did all sorts of different kinds of movement. Somebody doing a long jump. In this case, simply a ball bouncing. Again, being able to know the sequence of time that these were made. It gives you a measurable way to record movement. I love this picture. So you can see a young child walking across the, the frame. On one side, you see somebody who's kind of ushering the child across and a pair of hands on the left to receive that child. Undoubtedly, the photographer would have probably cropped this image about like so. But uh, to me, the charming part really is both ends as well as the young child moving across the frame. But groundbreaking approaches to studying motion. But frankly, through these scientific methods, also introduces the idea of abstraction, of seeing in ways photographically that differs from how we would see with the unaided human eye. Thomas Aikens was impressed with Mike Bridges photographs. He used some of these photographs to base parts of his paintings. Aikens was a realist painter and a Philadelphian. He based his art on scientific principles. In addition to being an accomplished painter and watercolorist and teacher at the University of Pennsylvania, Thomas Aikens was a dedicated photographer. He worked with a view camera and glass plate negatives, made platinum prints. He distinguished himself from most other painters of his generation by mastering the technical aspects of the new medium and required his students to do the same. For Aikens, the camera was a teaching device comparable to anatomical drawing, a tool the modern artist should use to train the eye to see what was truly before it. Aikens' highly accurate paintings, as you see in this image here. He was known for his realism in his paintings. So undoubtedly, the tool of of photography would allow him to study things in ways that again just standing before them he could not see. He used the camera as that tool and it allowed him in stopping motion to be able to paint in anatomical accuracy. Here's a series of studies for perspective drawing, and you can kind of see how elaborately he puts his images together to make them realistic and accurate. They are gr glorious works of art, as are his finished paintings. But I think you can see from these illustrations why he'd also be interested in photography. In an image like this, you're going to see that he likely used photographs to create these accurate images of boys diving and standing and lying around at the swimming hole. So here you can see one of his 
photographs. He is the one that hired Mybridge to come to the university to teach and to research. And certainly Mybridge would have influenced these studies. For Aikens, the photograph, like an easel, was a tool and a means to an end. You can see the influence of both Mybridge and Marais in these Thomas Aikens photographs and how they might be used in paintings to create something that was anatomically correct, therefore more realistic. He also sculpted, as you see here, and you see that pervading influence of Mybridge's early horse pictures. The early photographs of Jacques-Henri Lartigue were not made to resemble those of a child. He was a child. By the time he was 10, he was making photographs that anticipate the best small camera work of a later generation. Lartig came from a wealthy family, and he made the best of it. From the subjects of his pictures, one would assume that his life of his family was dedicated wholly to the pursuit of amusement, the beach, the racetrack, beautiful women in elegant costumes, heroic motor cars and daredevil drivers, flying machines, all manner of splendid games, including photography itself. Even if Lartig had been an ordinary photographer, his document of these times would be precious, but he was in fact a photographer of great talent. He caught memorable images out of the flux of life with the skill and style of a great natural athlete, a visual athlete to whom the best games of all was seen clearly. He used a hand camera, and he used the instantaneous aspects using the shutter to stop motion. What we see in his photographs is images of everyday life but done in, in a way that are both interesting and charming. You can see this woman leaping up to hit a tennis ball. You can see the tennis ball stopped in motion and she's leapt off the ground, and for posterity, she is always like that. These still images capture these instant, these brief moments, and record them in a way that the human eye cannot see, but the camera records. So these early photographs show these people usually out having fun, recreating, riding bikes, moving in fast cars, but it's their stop action. It's the ability of the camera to, to record these brief instances. So we can see, again, a woman leaping to hit a tennis ball. We don't see her as she leaps. We see her at the height of that movement, and she's there forever in this photograph. I mean, look at how he uses the shutter in an image like this. As you can see, a friend uh, falling off of a cart. If you look, it looks like she's smiling. And it was probably fun until she hits the ground. But we don't see that in the photograph. We just see that brief instant. It's the illusion of reality. Photographs are different than real life. In an image like this, the woman leaping down the stairs in what looks like almost a precarious fashion. Does she land on her feet? Or does she take a tumble and skin her knees and her elbows and her chin? We don't really know. What we're left with is simply that instant. Or a photograph of a friend leaping off a fence using an umbrella as a parachute. My guess is it didn't work very well as a parachute. You can kind of see the su surprise on his face if, if you look at, at that. Is he about to land on the barrel? 
or on the chair. From this perspective, you can't really tell. It looks like that. But who knows what really happens? It's the illusion that makes the photograph interesting. Or of this person falling into the water. He never quite hits the water. He just stays suspended in motion. That's the charm of Lartigue photographs. They also, to some extent, render the time, as you can see people experimenting with flight. This is an image from World War I. So you can see the soldiers in the foreground and the double-decker plane in the background. He seemed to love speed, as you would see in a number of images of carts and race cars and bike riders. This image is made with a camera, camera with a circular shutter. He's panning the camera to try to keep up with the race car. In doing so, as the shutter curtain goes across, part of the film is being exposed while the other is cut, being covered up while the camera's also in motion, that sense of panning the camera, and creates this really unusual distortion. This kind of distortion is only capable through a camera lens and through a shutter. This kind of distortion would have never been likely conceived without the use of photography. Harold Edgerton created some of the most memorable photographs of all time. Edgerton was an educator, an engineer, an explorer. Known as Doc or Papa Flash, Edgerton had degrees from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1926 and 1931. His doctoral dissertation included a high-speed motion picture of a motor in motion. From 1927 until his death, Edgerton was a permanent member of the MIT faculty, first as a research assistant, then an instructor. From 1931 onwards, Edgerton developed and improved strobes and used them to freeze objects in motion so that they could be captured on film by a camera. In the same year, he developed techniques to use the strobe for ultra-high-speed movies. Before the stroboscope was available commercially, Edgerton, with two others, worked as consultants with a variety of industries. By the mid-1930s, he was photographing everyday phenomenon. Here you can see a man simply raising his arms, using a strobe on one plate over and over again to give you a quick view, essentially multiple images on that one frame. In 1932, Edgerton saw the first commercial model of his stroboscope hit the market. Again, in this image, you can see him photographing with the multiple strobe, the majorette as she twirls her baton. One of Edgerton's milk drop photographs was included in New York's Museum of Modern Art's first photography exhibit in 1937. That same year, he began designing studio strobes for John Milley, who became a well-known photographer for Life magazine. I remember when I was a young child seeing this image, also published in Life magazine. In 1940, MGM invited Edgerton to make a stroboscopic high-speed motion picture with comedian Pete Smith. The 10-minute short, called Quicker in a Wink, won an Oscar. This is one of the great images that Edgerton produced. Uh, I remember uh, not too many years ago seeing a special on public television about Edgerton. The video started with a gallery opening of Edgerton's photographs. He was being interviewed on camera and kind of chuckling about the fact that people were considering him an artist. He really considered himself a scientist, and that was his interest. But certainly, as you look at this Im image of a bullet 
piercing an apple, you can tell that he looked at the visual aspects of his imagery as well as the scientific information that they provided. What you're seeing is a bullet as it's pierced the apple, done at such a high speed with a, such a, a, a flash that indeed you can see both the entry and exit of the bullet through the apple. To provide contrast, he used a blue background. If he was certainly just interested in science, that's something he probably wouldn't thought too much about. And also notice what the apple is uh, being held with. It's a bullet casing. So whether he considered himself an artist or, or not, there's certainly visual appeal to his work, and he looked at the aesthetics of the image as well as I said before, the scientific information. Another image here of a bullet stopped in motion, piercing a playing card. One of the things I think you can obviously tell, he's using specialized equipment that is giving him the opportunity to make photographs at a very minute fraction of a second something that most photographers don't have access to. Harold Edgerton and two others incorporated in 1947 at the request of the Atomic Energy Commission, now known as EG&G Incorporated. They designed and operated systems that timed and triggered nuclear bomb tests. They invented a camera that triggered a mechanism that opened and then cut off the exposure in as little as two milliseconds. Here you're seeing photographs taken just after the explosion of a nuclear bomb from a point seven miles away. In 1952, the National Geographic Society asked Edgerton to join them in an underwater exploration with Jacques Cousteau, who became a lifelong friend. Edgerton built an underwater flash and cameras for Cousteau. Realizing the murky ocean waters required a sound system to augment his cameras, Edgerton developed a penetrating sonar and echo sounder he called a pinger that emitted sound waves to the ocean floor. I'm going to show you just a couple other images using the camera to record motion in different kinds of ways. Frank and Lillian Gilbreth were efficiency experts. They used the camera here to record motion so they could look in manufacturing for ways to cut time. You can see that the movement of the hands are being recorded and you can notice that the time is being recorded there as well. One of the photographers who brought the Gilbreth's work to light was Mike Mandel who did a book of their work, but also used their work to influence some of his recent photography. Here you can see that he attached lights to the hands of someone in a tongue-in-cheek tribute to the Gilbreths as they emptied their refrigerator. 